Well, hi. You know, Chick-fil-A has been onto something for almost 30 years, since 1995. Their ads and billboards with cows scheming, you know, <laughs> to get people interested in eating chicken rather than beef are attention grabbing. And people get a kick out of deciphering the bad handwriting and the spelling. On the other hand, we don't get a kick out of spell checker when it goes haywire, <laughs> like what happened to my friend one time. No, I did not write. It was good to connect with my Christian brothel. I, I wrote brother, brother. <laughs> and funny though those things might be, our society has become lax regarding handwriting and spelling, which represents a bigger problem that just might spell the end of civility. I'll give you a heads up about that problem in the next episode and see how your good character can make a difference. Hi, I'm Doug Newton, pastor for 45 years, national award-winning magazine editor, author of 24 books, and this is At the Intersection with Doug Newton, where scripture, culture, and character meet. And I'm here to help you pursue the kind of character needed to align with scripture faithfully and engage culture graciously. Now, each week, I make one observation about our culture. I give one insight from the Bible that speaks to that issue. And I suggest one way to strengthen the character that you and I need in order to relate to our mixed up world with exemplary grace and fresh impact. Now, this is a no gripe zone. Our question is not what's wrong with our culture. It's about what's the right way to respond. So, here we go. Now, I know I may sound like an old, curmudgeonly, stick-in-the-mud, persnickety perfectionist, but I wonder if many of the educators who decided to dump spelling and handwriting from Common Core Standards for K-12 through education in 2010 have really thought that through. <laughs> I mean, I understand that lots of people wonder why it's even necessary to expect little kids to learn how to make good letters with straight up and down lines and curves within the spaces and the dotted lines when they're likely going to spend most of their time striking keys rather than stroking pencils. Well, actually, there are educators like Drew Gilpin Faust, the first woman to serve as president of Harvard University, who warn of impending problems coming as a result of the 2010 removal of cursive handwriting, for example, from Common Core. The bone she picks has to do with the danger of disconnecting people from history directly, since most historical documents require, require uh, reading cursive. Documents as important as the Declaration of Imp Independence, for example. And she argues that losing the ability to read cursive because it's no longer taught in thousands of schools, leaves the average person at the mercy of historians or other people translating cursive into legible script. And she worries that relying on a mediator between us and those historical documents leaves us easily uh, manipulated by unscrupulous political actors who may want to mess with historical records. Well, that's cursive, right? But why should we care about good handwriting if it's printing or accurate spelling? I mean, so I scoured the internet to read the arguments from both the pro and the con sides of the debate, and I found interesting stuff. But it's what I didn't find that was both disturbing, but not sadly surprising. Let me share with you what I found and see if you notice what I noticed was missing. First, here are the common top reasons I found in several professional reports in favor of teaching good handwriting and spelling. First, they say the, the brain engages differently when we write something in hand. Studies show that writing improves memory. Students retain learning better when working with new ideas through handwriting instead of typing. And I found that in my own life. I tend to rem remember something more if I actually write it down longhand. 
Many writers attest to the value of handwritten first draft because they can interact with what they've written as a whole. Typing on a screen tempts us to instead to edit as we go, which then fragments and dissects and potentially interferes with the organic flow of, of ideas. They say that handwriting can help us slow down and fully engage with our thoughts. And finally, they say being able to write effortlessly enables the mind to focus more fully on the topic. Now, let's listen to the other side on why teaching good handwriting and spelling is unnecessary and can even be detrimental, they say, if handled poorly. They say that children learn to write better without worrying about spelling because writing is about finding your voice. Each of us has a unique voice and no one can teach us to find it. They say that traditional spelling list method of teaching spelling produces anxiety in children and in their parents having the kids learn the words, the spelling words for the week. They say that focus on spelling encourages perfectionism. Perfect spelling, they say, is something people do when they're scared of doing something wrong. They say that spelling accurately is no longer necessary because spell checkers and uh, programs like Grammarly will clean up your mistakes, so it's really kind of a waste of time to worry about proper spelling and grammar. And finally, they say that proper spelling no longer is a significant indicator of educational level. Um, You know, sometimes people wanted to learn to spell right and write well because it would indicate that they were more sophisticated from an educational or an academic standpoint. But since the computer's autocorrection is all there for all of us, it really masks how good a person is in their education or not. So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't tell us anything anymore. Well, it's an interesting debate. But it's even more interesting to notice a line of thinking that's missing on both sides of the issue. You see, both sides focus only on the benefits or the detriments to the individual himself or herself. None of them talk about the impact on those who want to read what a person has written. And while most of us can figure out what another person meant when they wrote especially with an X or hypochondriac with a K or when the Chick-fil-A cow wrote, you know, burgers are delicious attributed to no one ever, that's not the point. The point is, here's another case when every reason both sides came up with focuses only on the self, the one who's expressing himself or herself. It seems like ever since the legendary 1960s, our strongest passion and desire is for self-expression. And what does it matter how my words affect anyone else as long as I'm able to say what I want to say? So whether you think handwriting or spelling is important or not, that issue really is just a metaphor that raises this bigger issue that we have been overpowered in this culture by the assumption that self-worth, self-fulfillment, and self-expression are inseparably linked. Even our constitutional right to freedom of speech has been largely recast as a matter of freedom to express myself without restriction. Now, don't get me wrong, I prize the freedom of speech. I think we all need to do everything within our power to uphold that right and not let it become constricted, controlled, or worse, censored in any way. But at the same time, we must also rediscover the highest value of personal expression. Our communication should benefit others and draw us into healthy relationships. Now, for that to happen, we simply must be much more concerned about clarity of speech for the respectful exchange of ideas, beliefs, and feelings upon which healthy human relationships depend. For way too long in this era, 
we have bent the purpose of words and communication in the direction of simply getting things off our chest or out of our minds with far too little concern or effort on making sure those words are understood by and beneficial to others. The famous language and communication theorist S.I. Hayakawa pointed out that communication has not yet actually occurred when a speaker simply speaks, but only when the receiver hears the meaning that the speaker intended. And that's way harder than most people think, and it requires much more than just getting words out of your mouth or onto paper. Now, as believers in the Christian God, the one in the Bible, revealed in the Bible, we should recognize that the quest for clarity is actually divine work. It's God's work. You know, for our sake, God wanted to tell us about himself. And so, what did he do? According to Psalm 19, he made the heavens to declare his glory and reveal his nature. Look at what Psalm 19 says. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all of the earth, their words to the end of the world. But... (laughs) The heavens could not tell us enough about heaven's supreme being. And so God took the next step. He gave us history's most remarkable book, God's Story. And his spirit not only prompted the minds of those who spoke or wrote those words, but then proliferated those words and protected those words across the languages, cultures, and centuries of time. But because even those written words still were not enough to be perfectly clear, he saw to it that his son, the original and eternal word of God, became flesh and lived visibly and audibly among people in human history so that we would truly know him, all the things about him, so that we would no longer play a guessing game about his nature and his love, and and just think of him in some kind of supreme being generic terms. If this teaches us anything, it should teach us that the passion for clarity of communication is divine work, and divine work is always designed for the good of others. If all you care about when it comes to expression to get something off your chest or an opinion out of your mouth or a placard plastered in some kind of rally, you've done little to communicate words that count. Words that help a hearer say, I understand where you're coming from. That's what counts. And that doesn't happen when your words are mere blurtations. That's my word. (laughs) Blurtations. I made it up. You don't know what I mean exactly, do you? I mean, you can kind of guess, but to be sure, I need to explain, don't I, don't I, in order to be clear? Well, a blurtation is a word or a phrase that a person blurts out without regard for how it strikes another person. Now, even if you don't literally blurt something out volume-wise, something is a blurtation if you're leaving the responsibility with the hearer or the reader to know what you meant. You know, in days gone by, young teens who mumbled and didn't lift their heads when they were speaking would often be told by their parents or others, stop mumbling, look up when you speak. If you want to be heard, you've got to speak so that other people can hear. (laughs) I heard that. Did you hear that? We, all of us, in this saying what I want to say is all that matters culture, could use a dose of that counsel actually a heavy dose. If we want to be heard, we need to speak so we're understandable. Trying to hear our words as the receiver is hearing them is crucial. Trying to sense our tone of voice as the receiver senses it is crucial. Trying to imagine our body language or our facial expression as the receiver sees it is crucial. 
<laughs> my wife tells me that my words can be saying, no, there's nothing wrong, but my eyebrows are clearly saying, I'm troubled. <laughs> and I can be saying, no, there's nothing wrong, but my eyebrows are, no, there's nothing wrong. See, all of this, words, tone, body, face, it's part of communication. And, and, you know, researchers tell us that it's the largest part of communication, and we should care about that much more than mere blur blurtations. Well, I know what I mean. I know how I meant it. I'm sorry you got it wrong. <laughs> well, nine times out of ten, if a person misunderstands your meaning or intent, that's on you, and it's on me, not them. Excuse me. That's why, <clears throat> for many years, counselors have taught people in conflicted relationships to learn the art of repeating back to the other person what you thought you heard and asking, is that what you meant to say? And that's all well and good. But really, that gets things backward. The onus of responsibility should not be on the receiver of the words, but on the sender. We shouldn't put the receiver in the position of having to clarify for us. We, each of us, simply need to take more responsibility for making sure that our meaning, our intent, our attitude is clear. That's the only way to turn self-serving blurtation into communication that serves others. And so, speaking metaphorically, just metaphorically, start working on, on writing more legibly and spelling more accurately. In other words, start working on being much more clear, and I guarantee you'll be living more peacefully with others. And you know, in our express yourself culture, embroiled in so much conflict, we need to start valuing free speech so much that each of us is willing to pay a higher price for free speech, namely by putting out the effort to communicate carefully and clearly. Well, I've written another crosswalk for you this week. Here it is. It's got some practice exercises to help you develop the habit of thinking more carefully about how other people hear and understand you. I think you're actually going to enjoy these practice exercises. Well, if you appreciate what I'm trying to do in this podcast, again, I'm asking, would you share it with friends and please subscribe to my Fresh Impact YouTube channel? It'll help so much indicate to the algorithm that there are people out there who really care about improving their character as a way of relating with more grace in this mixed up world. In 24 hours, I'll have a permanent version on YouTube and an audio only version for those who want to listen on the go. And all of that information about the podcast, uh, both past and future, can be found on our website. All of the links can be found at the end of this video. Well, thanks again so much for tuning in. If you think this podcast is a valuable resource also and hope that it will continue to be, would you leave me a comment? or send me an email. Well, I hope that you'll join me again next week at the intersection with Doug Newton. You know, I'm already looking forward to talking to you about the topic of an open border we need to close. In the meantime, remember, no more blurtations, please. <laughs>